Hi right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Another episode on Gun Lab. I'm Ian. Today we're going to take a look at some 1911 castings we have here. Uh, we have a friend, professional in the gun business, who wanted to do a production run of 1911s. And so he looked up some casting companies and uh, ordered a big batch of these guys to use as his starting point and discovered that they are complete crap. And we thought that uh, a real good opportunity for us to take a look at them and examine why something that at first glance here doesn't look half bad uh, really would be completely worthless. So to start with, we need to consider what you actually expect from a casting and what, what it can do for you. And the idea is by investing, investment casting a piece, you can use an alloy of material that allows you, um, that, that has all the really good properties and strengths that you want, and it doesn't necessarily have to be all that easy to machine. Whereas if you're going to start with a big block of metal, it's important to have, have it relatively easily machinable so that you're not wearing out two or three machining bits on every part that you're making. So basically by forging and, and machining a component, you may have to make some compromises in, uh, in your material selection, where investment casting allows you to use an ideal material, and especially in the case of something like a 1911 frame, you may have to go through a lot of work to make the casting uh, dies once, but once you've done that, you can make a large volume of parts for a very small incremental cost. However, in order to really effectively use a casting, it has to have a couple of things. It has to have some reference points, because there are going to be machining operations you have to make to it, whether it's drilling holes, or cutting serrations, or dovetails, or guide rails, in the case of the 1911. You have to make some of those machining cuts, no matter how good your casting is. And in order to do that, you have to be able to set the part up quickly and easily in, in a jig on a machine tool. Typically, you would, do, you would have a, your parts have very good uh, dimensional tolerances, uh, very good flatness tolerances, and possibly have um, a hole that is a, a very good known dimension, so that you could, say, put your part on a pin uh, around that hole and know exactly where, where your tool is. So in a lot of ways, casting is kind of like cheating. It lets you uh, get away with not having to do a whole lot of machining operations. You know, and, and fairly intricate, complex, expensive operations like broaching or cutting out the magazine well hole on a, a 1911 frame. So there's a lot going for a casting. Um, and let's take a look a little more closely at these guys and see how they stack up, um, how usable these would be. Um, I'll tell you, these came from a company that was originally called Cast Industries. They changed their name, which is often not a good sign, to uh, Coast Metal Casting, and I believe that's their current trade name, Coast Metal Casting. Uh, first thing we found right off the bat on these is that they're not actually flat. Let's take a look, we're going to put this down on our, uh, our surface plate here and take a closer look at it. Exactly what we've got. So for those of you guys who uh, aren't familiar with it, this is a, a granite surface plate. It is extremely close tolerance for flatness, used for uh, measuring all manner of things. This is a pretty standard piece of shop equipment. And with a good 1911 frame, I should be able to put it down there, and it'll be nice and flat. That is not flat. I expect there you can see the light coming through the places where it's not flat. It's particularly not flat if we look at the guide rails right there. Our slide is really no better. You can hear that rattling back and forth too. And you'll notice on the slide there are no holes in it. Say the, the slide stop hole for example. There are in fact no reference points at all on this. And once we start getting into some of the smaller areas inside, like the relationship of the firing pin hole to the guide rails, or when we actually have to machine the guide rails, their relationship side to side with the frame, all of those data points, you have no reference to start with, which makes this extremely difficult to use. Normally, on a casting like this, we would be able to take this and only have a handful of operations that we would need to do to it. There's going to be something like this uh, where it's cut off a tree on, on any casting, and that'll have to be cleaned up. But ideally, and any legitimate casting, these two sides would be nice and flat, nice and parallel, 
and we'd have a nice good tolerance on overall length. So we'd be able to take this, set it in a, a machine jig, push it all the way to the front, and know exactly where we are, and be able to come in with a CNC machine and just clean off the top. No problem. Again, on this, because it's not flat, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the, the overall length is probably not consistent. Um, you can't do that. You have to start by basically guessing and coming up with a starting point and then grinding everything else to that, which means you're redoing every single surface on the part, which completely negates the point of having it cast in the first place. We shouldn't have to do that. We should be able to come in, drill the hole for the firing pin, and then you know a few other small operations, the, the slide serrations, the, uh, oh, what else? Oh, and the, the big one is the, the rails. Extractor groove. Right, the extractor groove in there. Um, we and should be able to come in and do those. Front barrel bushing. Yeah, clean that up so it's very precise. We should be able to do those and that's it and be done. Whereas on this guy, and on the frame as well, you almost have to go in and remachine every single surface. And that is the sign of a crap casting. So I mentioned that we got these from a friend who's in the professional manufacturing business. He ended up losing any chance at, at a nice contract on 1911s because there's nothing he can do with these castings. There's, you know, it would be less work for him to start with raw, raw blocks and machine them down to this final shape. So just for an interesting reference, the way a 1911 was originally manufactured, it wasn't cast or fully machined. It was done initially with a forging, where uh, you'd have this overall outline of the gun stamped out by a forging press. And then you would get two reference points. One would be very likely this hole, and one would be one of the, uh, like the hammer hole, hammer pin hole up here. And those two holes would fit in every jig that your frame went on for a machining operation, which meant you knew it was always in the same location, you knew what that location was, and you could reference all your tools against those two holes. Uh, the problem here is we have this one hole, and even if we assume that this is reliably in the same place every time, we have to find a second hole, which means we have to take a, a dimension off of, say, this surface. The surface isn't flat here, so we take this and put it on a surface grinder and grind this nice and flat. But by the time we get this flat, who knows how much trouble we have gotten ourselves into with the dimensions down to this, the, how deep the slide is on the frame, all of those other dimensions are now completely up in the air. So as they say, caveat emptor, be aware of what you're buying and, and make sure you, un, you need to understand what your requirements even are. Um, I think a lot of home builders looking at parts like this wouldn't necessarily know what they need to look for in the first place. So you need to know what you need and then you need to be able to assess the product and determine if it actually meets your needs before you go and lay out some cash on it. So I hope this has been informative. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in to Gun Lab.